So the year is 1351, Cormac de Corsi, and you have just departed your sire, having been under his wing up until now. And he tells you on departure that the Prince of Lincoln has requested his presence in court as an advisor, that he intends to spend much time between Lincoln and Cambridge if you ever should need of him. And you, with eternity ahead of you, are free. What are your plans? All right. So Cormac's plans are to return to Ireland. He doesn't have the plans to talk to his family, being that Patrick is so very uh, competitive towards him. But he does want to see how his mother is doing, as she's the only one he's had any communication with over these past several years. And she does not reveal much about what's going on at court. It's actually very interesting timing that you return when you do. When you return to Ireland, you quickly discover your brother, Patrick de Corsi, is in a feud with Walter Bork, Lord of Connaught and the now Earl of Ulster, through a marriage of Hugh de Lacey's daughter and it is certain to erupt in violence within the next year. And you know that with the resources at the Lord of Connaught's disposal, he is, uh, he is at a much greater advantage than your brother, being the Baron of King at Kingsale. Your mother is doing well, although she is concerned that your brother Patrick is in over his head and that he's going to get himself killed, aside from the entire loss of the barony. What do you do? Have I arrived at King's Sale at this point, or is that, I'm just getting that in uh, her letters? This is, you arrive and you learn this in 1352. Because I imagine you go there more or less immediately, right? Yes. He'll, he'll ship to Dublin and then head right over to King's Ale. Mm hmm Yeah, then you learn this in 13, we'll say 1352. At first, his only desire is to approach his mother, Margaret, but seeing that things have become so bad, I know he doesn't want to see me, but I think he should. I might be able to help. She agrees to try and arrange for a meeting between the two of you, and because of her influence, you do get a meeting with your brother Patrick in uh, his study one evening. Does he think it at all odd that I request to have an evening meeting? He either doesn't think it odd or he doesn't show it, perhaps he doesn't care, you're not sure. He obliges you, though. And he'll knock on the study door. Come in. Cormac opens the door and stands there for a moment. He looks much different than the last time Patrick saw him. Older, wiser, perhaps. And there's definitely an air of something mysterious about him now. His pale skin, the furs he wears around his shoulders. Brother. What is so important that you must come back here? He stands and, and, and crosses his arms. I didn't come back here to see you. I came to see our mother. She told me of the situation with Ulster. He grimaces at the mention. There's none of your concern. Not anymore. Regardless of what documents I signed or what I've said, I'm still a de Corsi. These are our ancestral lands, and he's striving to take them from you. 
I can help. And what could you do? Things are different now, brother. I'm a different man than I was. And he'll stride into the room, letting his brother see him in the full light of the, the candles and lanterns. Do you not see a difference? He eyes you suspiciously, standing at an angle away from you. His eyes are narrowed. What is this? What it is, is the return of a wayward son at a time when he's needed most. A charisma expression roll for me. Difficulty seven. Oh no, I have no macros. Maybe you can help. If that is why you really came back and not just to claim all this. I would not dream of such a thing. And there is no way now I could bear an error anyway. I can't explain to you why. You'll just have to take my word for it. He has many resources, he has many men. He's going to take the barony, or try to. His family's run short of allies. His eyes gonna go to the ground, dejected. It's not what it was when father was around. Father had a way with words. You're not the same as he. Still, I find it hard to believe you've chased all our allies away. You learn the real grit and the metal of a man, of a friend, when you're facing adversity. I've learned the metal of a brother when I'm facing adversity. He says, looking at him straight in the eyes. The accusation hangs heavy. But with things as they are, maybe a time for a new beginning. Perhaps we can find some way to intercede. Do you still have the king's ear, or have you lost that too? He grimaces at that. You'll take an audience from me, if only because I'm my father's son. But Walter Bork has his influence. What do you propose? I'm not sure yet. I've only just arrived. It'll take me some time to draw up a plan. I hope not too long. 
I have already heard of the towns being mustered, levies being raised. I expect within the year, we will produce his demands. I can only raise a few hundred now. Cormac winces at that. A few hundred? Perhaps it's time you make amends with some of those who have served us in the past. He smiles for a moment almost uh, mockingly at himself. To what offense? Even I don't know. It seemed they most up and ran to his side when it became clear there were sides. And perhaps you can send me to ask them. He looks up to you very, very seriously. You are free to try. Do not hold a hope. It is forsaken in these lands. How very dramatic of you. Look around us, brother. What is Ireland anymore? being divvied up, piece by piece. I recognize the futility of this feud. But I won't let my father's honor be dismayed. Nor will I. I loved our father. For as long as I knew him. Think on your plans. I will accept any aid at this point, even yours. Should I decide to ride to the outlying counties, I'll need something from you as well. Horses and a small cadre of men. As I said, I can provide some, but not as much as you remember. And I'll make plans for travel and have them to you by the morrow. He nods, his arm kind of outstretched on the desk, looking over maps and documents. What do you do with the remainder of your evening? He's going to head to the old head's meager library and see if he can find a recent map of the political climate here. County divisions, things like that. It's not too difficult for you to pull up the new county lines as they've been cut up. And true to the description, it does seem like the domain has been reduced and that this, the Lord of the Cannot, Bork, seems to own directly uh, sizable portions of the land. He looks especially to their allies to the north and south, wondering which of them might be the best to approach first. Make 
a intelligence politics roll difficulty six. Sorry, I have to do this manually because no no uh, macros yet. You look over a few documents, you recall a few of the relationships that you left behind, and you think that those farther in the south would be more agreeable to siding with and perhaps even raising soldiers for Patrick in defense against Lord Bork. And south is where he'll plan to go first, but he's first he needs to acquire some resources. All right. What is your general plan here? All right. First he's going to see the stable master and see about getting some sturdy horses. He'll visit the quartermaster to see about food and possibly weapons that they can borrow. And then he'll go drumming up some help in the form of men. He's probably not going to get that all done in one night, so we'll start with the horses. Once you identify who you are and what you need, you are allowed the uh, access you need to the horses. You find that there are ten available that you can spare, that they are willing to spare for someone of your status in this uh, barony. And over the next night, Roll uh, Charisma Leadership, difficulty uh, 7. And how many men are you shooting for? A small cadre, maybe 10. He'll oh, take yeah. less if he has to. Yeah, you can get 10 men together. So they'll all be mounted, actually, which perhaps will look more impressive than uh, it actually is. So you have ten mounted men by the end of the next night. They need a little convincing when uh, you reveal your identity to them and your relationship to Patrick. These men at least are still loyal. That's good. And is he able to require the, or acquire the supplies he needs as well? The supplies beyond the horses? Yes, they're going to need food. Oh, yeah. Blankets, things like that. Yes. Yeah, you are supplied as you need to be. All right, then he makes plans to travel at nightfall within the week. Letting his brother in on his plans to go south. Who is it, perhaps the O'Hurlahees or the Donahees? Your brother approves the plan, although a bit, uh, not, perhaps not very optimistic. You have his blessing, at least, to try. Alright, then come the time, he will gather the men, allow them to say goodbye to their wives and families and take them away to the south, to the first of the lords. All right.
right after saying their goodbyes they join up with you and you begin riding south the swords do you have any without going into uh, a scene do you have any general argument that you're making uh, in support of your brother or are you just trying to gain a general support he has no argument to make in, on behalf of his brother, but he has an argument to make on the behalf of his grandfather, and his father as well, who was once Earl of Ulster himself, and lost it to thieving brigands. He does plan as necessary to make use of his vampiric gifts, his presence. Okay. That being the case, you can make a charisma expression. Uh, I'm going to put the difficulty at 7, but you can subtract the difficulty by your presence. Two successes, then. Not everyone you speak to, not all the lords are in support of this. They're wary of gaining the, the ire of Lord Walter. But enough do that you feel that this was worthwhile. You remind them of the, of the old ways of their pledges to your father and their father's pledges to your grandfather and the rightful claim and that any push to further take the barony away is certainly unjust and so you do gain the support of 200 men under these under these men under this lord that you've convinced And he will assure them that so long as Ireland belongs to good men, brigands like the son of Lacey will not succeed. He once did his grandfather wrong. Miles. Miles' father as well. Stealing the, the barony right from out, right out from under John de Courcy after his death. The lord you have recruited is the lord of Clan Domnail, just for reference. He commands 200 men of mostly light infantry. And they are willing to support you in battle. And he will ask if there's any other that Donald knows. Who might support the ways that they that, that it once was. Donnell tells you to save your time going north, that they're well in the pockets of Lord Walter, but that some in the Connacht, the wild inlands of Ireland, would be more likely to uh, to join forces if for no other reason than to strike out against this man who is clearly a puppet of the English although he cautions you that some in the Canucks are very old in their ways and very prejudiced as an Anglo-Norman, technically, you might be viewed as an outsider as well. He has been in the company of De Lacy long enough and met enough vampires to know exactly what tradition means. So he decides to tread carefully. He'll send notice ahead to the outlying regions of the Connacht that he's coming. And they should expect him.
Your messengers go out and return unharmed, and they report that you are expected, and it doesn't sound like you're going to be killed on sight, at least. It sounds like a lord in a place called we main is willing to hear you out and that will be his next destination you ride into the the heartland of Ireland and as you go you see some of the signs of the old ways you see people in villages who still where their pagan and old god adornments predating even the Irish Catholic Church. And you meet with this lord in Huimain, and he similarly is quite antiquated in his, his adornments, his dress, you can tell that, and in his way of meeting with you. Roll, uh, go with Charisma Etiquette, difficulty 6. Corbett makes as much of a show of this as he can. Putting on all the noble bearing he'd almost forgotten before leaving King's Ale. It's a very impressive display, and your appreciation for their culture, and clearly knowing the language, being able to speak Gaelic is a major boon to your efforts here, as they wouldn't believe anything that anyone had to say in French or English was worth anything more than shit. It goes very well. The meeting is a success. And this man... Oh, let's see. Who is this man's name who I'm creating right now? His name is MacDermot. Sorry, I need it. What's that? I'm sorry. The Irish lord you meet in We Main is MacDermot. Cormac actually remembers that name from conversations overheard in his youth. He's glad to see that this man is the kind who holds on to his pride and doesn't let the English bastards tell him what to do. Indeed, although they don't have the heavy infantry or cavalry of the English or the French, the warriors in this clan, the clan of McDermott and Weemane, they are fierce men, hardened by hard lives, and they are rumored to fight with ferocity unseen amongst the, the Normans, especially in these lands so wild. Apart from your dealings with the kind, you can't help but ignore the watchful gaze of something. It's an awareness that only 
a canine would have. You know there is something of great power in this area, and you have been noticed by it, but for now it seems to let you pass. Almost like feeling a great wave of water pass as you are wading through. You know its presence is there somewhere. Perhaps if only a reminder to tread carefully. In his haste to aid his brother, or rather their estate if nothing else, he'd almost forgotten that the world is full of powers like himself. Older, wiser. And he considers attempting to find local canines if there are such a thing. Here in these wildlands. Who might also remember the old ways and the legacy of his family. Beyond thinking of this, do you act on it? How long will the Lord have us in his lands? I don't want to stretch his hospitality too much. He's willing to harbor you for the month, but he expects that battle is soon after. Then while he gathers his men, Cormac is going to Join them at court and try to schmooze some of the the poorer folk, the servants of the house, to see what they might know about the surrounding regions and any mysteries that reside there. He treats it with all seriousness, although he he has no hearth wisdom himself. He doesn't know much about the wee folk or mm -hmm. things of that nature, but he's good with words. Are you making use of your gifts here? Certainly, if I need to, if they if they seem resistant to him, he will overcome them with the sheer force of his presence. You will have to, because they are loath to speak of things to outsiders, for is that is what you strike them as, despite speaking the language. There is a very clear distinction between you and them. So I'll have you. I was going to have you roll charisma empathy. So I'll have you instead roll straight charisma. And if you're using your presence, I'll put the difficulty at four. A marginal success, even with your power. You can tell these people are afraid to speak of such things. But they do speak and name one entity. The Witch of the Connacht. It is supposed to be some kind of spirit which haunts the night and protects the people from the great wolves. But it is also something which not even these natives will dare speak to or approach themselves. They will say nothing more about it though. He can't wheedle out where such a creature might be found. The way they describe it, the entirety of the Canacht is its domain. That's what you gather. Then Cormac decides he must be fearless. Knowing nothing of witches or warlocks or things like that, he can only assume that the creature they speak of is one like him. Perhaps a member of the more wild tribes, a gangrel. And because he hasn't learned to become a feared of werewolves either, he will take it upon himself one night to ride out alone, trusting in his unnatural nature to draw whatever this creature is to him. Entering the woods, unguarded,
He's not even sure himself why he's doing this, but he's always been rash. And if nothing comes of it, then nothing comes of it. How long are you willing to wait? Until it's so close to dawn that he doesn't feel he could make it back. Or just before that point. Well, you've got me in a pickle then. I'm probably going to have to pause us so we can come back to it because I did not at all anticipate this and was not prepared for it. <laughs> Way to go, Scott. You broke the game already. We're not even in the group session yet. I'm excited. You... Maybe won't be. No, I may not be. Gangrel are very territorial. Assuming, of course, this is not actually something worse, like a werewolf or some such. Give me a little bit to prep this, and I'll message you really quick. All right. I gotta mute this or I'm gonna laugh. That's not gonna be good. Okay. Let me get back into it. So you go out one of these evenings after hearing these stories intent on finding the Witch of Canacht. According to these stories, someone out here by that description at least. You're out in the wilds for a few hours away from the village, very far from any town or your men. Did you bring any men with you? Not out into the woods, no. So you are quite alone when you hear the first one start to move. Not far. You hear something like a snarl as the brush starts to move. You can see off in your peripherals. There's more than one, then there's more than five. howls. You heard stories about them. You knew they were in the places between cities. You'd never seen one. You don't know how many there are, but you can hear the movement, the howling, the snarling. little yelps here and there. Eventually, the brush parts, and you see something almost the size of a horse, but more canine. It's dark. The pelt is almost as black as night. And you can see the eyes, an amber yellow. The mouth is open on this creature, and the sounds around you haven't stopped. But then there's something, there's a change in the sound around you. A different kind of yelp, a, a wounded dog yelp, and this great wolf in front of you turns back into the brush and there's great movement there's something is something is happening here there's one and then two yelps the sound of more snarling there's fighting the brush is scattering the sounds become more faint as whatever was encircling you retreats, and a few moments later, that foliage opens up again. 
It parts and a figure steps forward into the moonlight. You realize this figure is making no sound parting the brush. And upon closer look, you realize the forest itself is obeying and moving out of the way precisely as what appears to be a young girl is walking towards you. And the clouds are parting as the moonlight shines down on this, this veiled girl. A thin collection of light rags that poorly conceal her nubile form. By legend, there could be nothing else, no one else, that could command the wild like this. She moves with awkward, animalistic movements. They're sharp, and yet somehow they make no sound. And she crouches forward towards you. Do you say anything to this? Cormac, being a, a brave sort, doesn't even take a step back as he watches her. His hand does lay easily on the, the hilt of his sword. One borrowed from his brother. As he says to this woman in, in Gaelic, in the old tongue of these lands, I seek the witch of the Connacht. As if in response, she draws her hand out from her back to the side and tosses you a large wolf's head. It must be the size you think of a horse. That is the comparison you keep coming back to. This thing is too big. The head is bloodied and it seems to have been ripped entirely off. But she says nothing else immediately. You saved me from those creatures. Why? Why? Here. And she points at you with the dirty but delicate finger. Why? Linger. Because I'm too curious for my own good. And I thought perhaps we could reach an accord. Her hand goes out to the surrounding area, gesturing generally. Mine. All. I do not seek to take from you your domain, but there are others who would. Norman? Saxon? She points at you. Norman by blood, but Irish through and through. Not native. No, but I wish I was. Kill Normans. Kill Saxons. And she crouches as she takes crouch steps forward, forward towards you. I am no longer one of them, he says. And he'll open his mouth and let his fangs descend. Norman Fang. She points up at your face. Why not kill? Because I come here standing against those who might take these lands from you. I don't seek to. I believe in the old Irish way of life. Who One take? Sorry, man. 
That's all she says. The English. Do you know them? English. They, they came here long ago, claiming these lands as their own. My great-grandfather among them. You kill? And she points to you. Only when necessary. She moves forward again, this crouched, kind of bent over, half bent form, and she picks up the large head, blood still leaking, and she kind of moves it around in a semicircle, making blood drips on the ground, and gestures towards it. Blood. Feed. You wish me to taste the blood of this creature? She shakes her head, and with her other hand, she begins to crush the head of this wolf, this great wolf, excreting all the blood and bone and brain matter onto the ground and smearing it across with both of her hands. Feed. Feed. Cormac is terrified now. A creature with such strength he's never seen. But he moves forward at her behest anyway and kneels before the, the pile of gore. She looks up at you very suddenly, very abruptly. And she points at you with a very bloody finger. Kill Normans. Feed. Earth. And she points from you to the ground, to the blood. Earth. Hunger. Feed blood. And she takes your hand in hers and smears the blood into the ground. He watches this, wondering what kind of magic she's hoping to perform here. If you're asking if I'm going to sk spill Norman blood, I can guarantee that. She looks at you and nods approvingly. Where, Normans? Where? Saxon English. For now, to the north. But they hope to move south and take my ancestral lands from me. Come here. Likely. She Eventually... Oh, so she does have fangs. You're a canine, then. Kill. English. North. Mine. And she gestures around. Feed Earth Norman blood. Feed Earth. English blood. You help. And she points at you, actually pressing her finger into your chest, pushing you back a little bit. I see now what you mean, he says, thinking about the implications. If I lead them here, you'll kill them one and all. She looks at you dead in the eye. Bring to me. All you can drink. You'll glut yourself on Norman blood. 
after. No return. And she points to you. You have my word. Would you like me to swear it in blood? She takes your wrist after a moment, and you can see her hands. Her fingernails are... perhaps two inches out. They're jagged. And with her hand, she drags into your wrist, cutting open the vein. He hisses a bit. She turns but he doesn't hand. pull. Sorry. She turns your hand over and lets blood flow into the ground where this lupine's blood is. She begins making some kind of signal, some occult brand into the ground. And no sooner does she finish than she rises and disappears back into the brush without a sound, without a trace, as though she was not there before. are left alone in this gore, with this bloody brand in the ground and a wound in your wrist. He tries to direct his blood to heal the wound. You're able to. He looks at the smears of blood across his wrist where <gasps> once it laid open, bare. Then looks around the woods, hoping he won't again see those amber eyes coming at him out of the darkness, that she's frightened them away. And he himself makes a quick exit. Sorry, go ahead. You realize as you're not distracted by her, that the smell of strong Vitae is all around you. It's intoxicating, and you almost are surprised you weren't distracted by it before. You can't help but pass through some gore on your way out. Nor can he help but stop and kneel down next to one of these bloody patches on the ground, taking some up on his fingers. <gasps> and running those fingers across his tongue. It's like nothing you've tasted even in life. War and undeath. It's, it's a sweet nectar you didn't know could be experienced. Dear God, he says to the darkness, what horrors have you wrought? It seems for now, whatever else lurks here is not daring come closer. And you are allowed to return to your men. He does so, looking very distant and even a little frightened wondering if he's just made a deal with Satan himself what will you do now after this night he considers trying to visit the other lords trying to scrape up what forces they're willing to give him and wondering if he'll need them now, given what he's just witnessed. But what will he tell his brother? That he met a witch in the woods and made a deal with her for the blood of his enemies? He decides in the end not to tell the men what he saw and to continue further to the north to at least a couple more land holds. His remain, plans... Sorry, Do you go remain ahead. in the Canucht? Actually, he's not sure if she meant the entire Canucht or just this part of it. I did say before, and uh, your character would definitely know, the rumors are the Canucht is where she 
holds domain. No one ever said where. And as his men are getting ready to travel north, he has a sudden change of heart. He tells them, We must return to the old head. We'll have the allies we need. Don't ask me why or how, he says. You must trust that there are forces in this world older than all of us. The men seem unsure, but have little choice but to follow you back. They're I, ask, grim. I ask that as we return you pray. Pray as hard as you might. That we are victorious in the battle that is to come. And that we are not taken in by the evil that lies here. They listen to you. They pray the whole way back. And you are promised that McDermott will bring his men, 300 strong, to join forces with you. And you return to Kingsale. Your brother wants to know how successful you were in raising men. He tells him first of the forces he's gathered to the south from Donal clan and from the forces to the north with the McDermott's. He waits to see how his brother reacts to this news first. He's surprised that you're that successful and uh, you see the glimmer of hope return in him. You get one of the few instances of recognition you've ever had from your brother that night. Although he still seems reluctant to be optimistic yet. There is more, Cormac offers. What more? I've made allies among the wild folk. They've asked me not to reveal who they are. But if we can rout Orp's forces through the southern Connacht, you will see what I have done. I just hope whatever you promised them, I can pay in the end. I promise them Norman blood, and I pray it's not our own. He looks suspicious at that. I just pray indeed. We march in a week's time. Then I suggest we be well prepared. Tell me what you need me to do. <laughs> he goes about detailing the plans to meet uh, Lord Bork's army before they've arrived. And mostly it's logistics. Having you as a field commander for a flank is very useful to him as the other commanders he would have relied on have defected or left. And Cormac will agree to do this, also agreeing to put aside their argument for now, and promising that when this is over and their lands are safe, he'll leave again and leave 
Kinsale's legacy in peace. Your brother nods to that, still reluctant to share too much good company with you. And the two of you said about making preparations, organizing men, sending messengers, making sure the clans know where to meet and when. And in two weeks' time, it is the night before, and your brother finds you. He speaks to you when he finds you somewhere in a hall, alone. We're marching tomorrow morning. I would be glad to see you at my side. In truth, I would prefer family there. If I am to fall, it would be by family. Cormac smiles, but he realizes he's about to have to give his brother very bad news. I'm afraid that's impossible, brother. The daylight is forlorn to me now. Something happened to me at Cambridge. Something monstrous. I won't frighten you with the details, but you must believe me. Were I to ride with you at the morning, I would not make it till the evening time. And you would have not to bury but a pile of ash. He looks at you with great suspicion, almost anger. Has a demon claimed your soul, brother? What magic is this? Magic it is, but not a demon. It was, in fact, a bishop. Once upon a time. You must believe me when I say I am a servant of God. You sound a heretic to me. He closes his eyes, deeply wounded by that. There's the brother I know. I should think that if my brother had become such a thing, if I should trust any of his plans. I'm still your brother. Are you now? And I've brought you the men you need. They certainly do not serve the devil, whether you think I do or not. These are good Irish men. Use them. And afterwards, perhaps I will pray the rest of my life for using them. And for whatever remains of your soul, Yes, that is one thing you can do for me. Pray. And should I come upon your armies at nightfall and find them victorious, I will know there is a God. Then what shall you be doing while we march? Tomorrow morning. Dreaming my dark dreams. He looks at you with more anger. Do not return to this household after tonight. Heretics and conspirers with the demons 
are not welcome here. Yes, he says, in a rare moment of somberness for him. I see the wisdom of it. I worry what might befall this household should I stay. But you must promise me to look after our mother for all the remainder of her days. And she doesn't have many left. You let me worry about her. As I have been. He nods. That hurts too, and his eyes drop a bit crestfallen. You still know how to wound with your words. You've always been good at that. Was it not you who sent me away in the first place? And I still so don't know if I should have kept you there. If I shouldn't have let you never come in to begin with. Let us hope I don't live to regret the aid you've offered me. You will live many days after and bear many children. This I can see with the dark sight that's been granted me. Or perhaps just an ember of hope. You're too ambitious to let our name die. Perhaps I will one day return to check on your ancestors. Your children's children's children. And perhaps then I'll receive a warmer welcome. He looks at you with, with venom, taking a step back, clearly disturbed by your words. He doesn't say anything more beside before turning away and, and quickly walking away from you down the hall. Until tomorrow night then, brother. It will be the last time we meet in this life. Alright. What do you mean to do with the last night before they march? He's actually going to try to boost your, bo bolster everyone's morale, knowing that this is definitely not one of Patrick's strong suits. And over the years, as head boy, he's developed a taste for leadership. Absolutely. You can make a charisma leadership role. Give you difficulty eight. They're facing difficult odds, and most are in grim moods. Can I use a willpower on that? cannot use willpower, you can use presence. Then he will. Okay, then I'll put it at six. Your, com your command over presence is significant. You do feel that your words have affected a good number of men here. Not all, but a good number. You see a few of them going to bed, not with hopelessness or, or the formation of fear, but hope, perhaps even courage. And Go ahead. This brings him some measure of joy so that when he does finally lay down for the day's sleep, he knows they'll stand a chance. And you lay down and go to sleep for the day. The day passes and you are unaware of the events that transpire until the next night and you wake up and everyone in the household is gone. Certainly the men are gone. Where do you go? I 
He will do as he promised his brother and ride to the north to try to find them. Or at least some of their outlying forces. He does not wish to set foot in the Connacht again, and he promised not to. But someone is sure to have news. Through your travels and knowing the land, you ride through some towns that did report seeing the armies move, and it seemed as though there was a retreat on your brother's part that they fought long. Apparently, they you, wa you wager through deduction. They must have marched north and waited some time before meeting the army sometime in the afternoon when the battle began. Because by the reports you're hearing, when they retreated, they retreated into the Canaan close to dusk. At which point, no man returned. Of either army. This strikes his heart with terror. And he presses on, hoping for news of his brother that he wasn't so foolish as to enter that place. After what he told him. And longing for his lost brothers who met their end by his hand. Give me a perception investigation standard difficulty. You aren't able to find anyone closer to the fields where you know that there was battle. Through earlier reports, you're able to find at least where the initial clash happened, and through some expertise, you're able to detect roughly where they went, and it certainly does appear they went north to the Canucks, but you don't know who did or did not enter, and no one you're talking to seems to be able to identify your brother or know who went in or out or any other better details. The only thing that is certainly clear is none of them saw men go back in the other direction afterward. Blast it and damn him. Now he's truly wondering if he made a grave mistake. But he continues pressing north, using all the skills available to him. And when the horse gets too tired to run, he feeds it blood to give it strength. Hating himself for being such a monster. You ride for hours, until finally you reach the lands where you know it is the Canacht, if you go any further. And the only settlements are further north. And that's at the, it's at the border of the Canacht where he chooses to wait. First securing a place that he can lay his head should the daylight come. Perhaps an abandoned shack out in the woods. Or the sunless bowl of a tree. You wait there a long time are returned with nothing but the silence of the night and the wind. No one comes south. And you know that day will come. It's gotten to the point where these... this small lodging you found, really kind of a dilapidated cottage long abandoned, is all you have against the sun at this point. He'll pry up some of the floorboards and dig himself a hole in the earth, as quickly as he might. At least enough that he can cover himself again with the boards and hopefully protect himself from the sun. You're able to do these things and secure 
crude, but survivable uh, supplies to survive the sun, and you sleep through the day again, only to find that the next night your horse is gone. Although your supplies, the saddle, the reins, everything that was attached to it is there, the horse itself is gone. Damn and blast my luck. First I kill my family, everyone I've ever knew. And now I'm going to die out here in the gods forsaken wilderness. He catches himself saying God's forsaken and slaps a hand over his mouth. You becoming a pagan now yourself, Cormac. Damn it. But he has no choice for it. He can't go further north. He begins drifting on foot to the south again, hopefully to stumble upon some settlement where he might be able to procure another horse. And news. It takes you half the night, but you do finally reach a rarely trodden little inn, little more than a, a home with an extra bedroom, really. And it's owned by an old couple that seems very removed from the world. They welcome you and even offer you their only horse, claiming that they're not going to need another horse. And if they do, they can go into town. Although which town, you're not sure. He asks them against hope if they have any news of the war that happened only two nights before. The wife explains to you that she did see uh, a number of men fleeing uh, another group. She saw them, some of them on horses, some of them just running up to the north into the Connacht, or at least in that direction. By now it's, I would say, 30 miles, 40 miles north. They went in that direction, certainly. And none have returned this way? She shakes her head. I thank you for everything you've done for me, and it will not be forgotten. Tell me, what is the nearest settlement to here? right now. Limerick is the name of the place you are given. Limerick, yes, I know it. May I have the pleasure of your names, please? The woman is Dana Yana, and the man is Arda Meher. Well then, Dana Yana and Arda Meher, you shall hear from me again. And with that, so go ahead. I was going to say, they both wish you luck. They seem regretful that they offered you news, which seemed to sadden you. All the same, he swears to remember their names. This is a great kindness they've done him. And he'll take his horse toward a limerick, hoping to reach it before it's too late. You ride hard, and it's close, but... 
you manage to make it to the city. Not really a city, really barely a town. Maybe a, a grandized village, even. But they have lodgings for you. They have horses. There's a port nearby. Somewhat close, at least. It's not very significant, but it exists. And you're able to find safe haven for the day in Limerick. What does, in general, what does Cormac mean to do now with apparently his entire household going up into nothing? I'm sure of what to do. He reaches deep inside himself for an answer. Spending even a couple hours of the next night. Asking the townsfolk, begging them for any news of any who have returned. A good number of them have heard of the skirmishes between your brother, Patrick, and the Lord, Walter Bork. But none of them have heard of anybody returning. They assume it was a massive bloodbath. But the battle itself, at least the initial collision of forces, doesn't have that many dead. Not enough to account for all those men, certainly. It's claims that Lord Walter brought 2,000 men of his own, and your brother Patrick had around six to 700. But there were less than 100 corpses on that field. This deeply unsettles him. But all he can do for now is return home and wait to see if any come back. All the while considering how he might leverage his fading station to get news of what happened up there. You're able to make it back to Kinsale through carriages and horses and except for the barony guards themselves the actual forces that were that belonged to Patrick the Levies his own retinue they're not there and your mother has become sickly in the absence but she asks you if, if you've seen Patrick she has not seen him in many nights now. I've searched for him far and wide, but I fear he might be gone, Mother. And he weeps then, turning his face from her so that she cannot see the blood. She can hear you all the same and, and ushers you come to her so that even even in your state that she might offer some some hope for you even sickly as she is he dabs his eyes as best he can and does come to her <laughs> and he what and he does come to her close enough that she can embrace him anyway You find comfort in your mother's arms, trying to give you some solace at the loss of your brother, and perhaps the loss of the household, at whatever tragedy is unfallen. But then she grows alarmed at the sight of the blood in your eyes that have started to dry on your face, and still in the corners. She asks you what's happened to you. I became ill after a fashion while I was away at college. 
or university, he says, not college. Do not fear for me, mother. Fear for your lost son. She seems to grow dejected and accepts your words at face value. She's very quiet, perhaps in thought, perhaps in just fatigue from this disease. It seems to have worked her up, the loss of one son and the sight of another one so ill. And she already in a weakened state. It wounds him even more that he can do nothing to help her. He would not dare offer her his cursed blood. Nor is she fit for the gift of eternal life. Even if it were his to give, which, which he cannot be sure. Then he go ahead. Go ahead. Um, then he mourns for himself for a while, as he knows what the morrow will bring if none return. That perhaps he must break the vow he made. The morning comes and goes, and the next night, you do hear of one man who returned, horseless, on foot. He seems, he seems to blather on. You can't tell about what, no one can tell about what. He's bloodied and cut, but there are also these brands in him, these sigils. Some carved, some just marked. He's dirtied, and you can see that his boots are are worn away to nothing. It's a miracle he's alive at all. But he's making no sense. It's as though he returned without any thought, without any knowledge of why or what to do afterwards. Ormacle listened to his words, hoping to hear anything that might give him comfort. That others escaped with him, or... Not everyone was slaughtered in, in that land. But as time draws on, he thinks that's going to be less and less likely. Enigmas, I'd give you something, but or maybe hearth wisdom, but you you can't make sense of it. It sounds like you've heard of something so roughly comparable. Men who have been in heavy combat in the past, who have seen terrible things, they have a similar look about them, and some of them have also been reported to say madness and to become completely incapable and to be cared for afterwards at the end of their days but this is strange to you the way he appeared and he talks about things that can't be true he does not report anything about anyone coming back with him And Cormac feels truly lost. What will he do over the next weeks or months? Or years? He will stay a few weeks at least.
to see what befalls the household in his brother's absence. And to try to salvage some of the damage he's done. Although there is no air now. As you might have eventually surmised, there is always some male who claims some distant relation. And after a few weeks, when likely the domain of Lord Walter gets the same impression you do that no one is coming back, they begin to open parlay with your household about making amends and this some young man who claims to be uh, technically a cousin of yours uh, he claims enough title it's a weak claim to press but with no one else really arguing he claims the Earl of Ulster the Earldom as well as the barony In her remaining days, or does she die over the next couple weeks as mother? Your mother grows weaker by the day and night. She develops a fever in the second week, and she does eventually pass one evening while you are there. It seems that her heart just gives out. Before she goes, because he knows it's coming, he's certainly seen plenty of death. He asks that she legitimize the claim of this young heir, if for nothing else than save their household and their name, which he has so readily destroyed. She can barely hold a quill to sign anything, and the signature is little more than a drag of line, but it's witnessed and uh, approved by signatories and officials. The heir is legitimized, the earldom of Munster is retained, and it seems that the barony is kept, at least nominally, in the name of de Courcy. Although what remains of your family, there's little to speak of. For better or worse, it seems your mission here is done. There's one last thing he wants to try to bring about before he leaves. That is to find his young cousin, one who again takes a wife, one who is of pure de Courcy blood. I'm sorry, which cousin do you want to find? My cousin who's now the, the Baron. Okay. He wants to find him a wife of pure de Courcy blood. Okay. It's something that was done just to maintain the bloodline, even if it's close family. Mm -hmm. You're able to find uh, a mutual cousin, and it's an acceptable wedding, or marriage, I should say. He's glad for the the assistance, for the aid. Uh, he's not exactly clear on who you are. Your name is already becoming a, a memory, even though it's not been that long. And he will tell him, I'm a distant relation. One who wishes to see our line prosper. You will may see me again. He thanks you all the same and tells you you are welcome anytime you wish. You have saved your family's bloodline for whatever that still means. What will Cormac do with the rest of eternity?
After his mother's funeral, he will return to England. It's really the only home he's really known. He remembers his youth in, in King's Ale, but a lot of those memories are bad, and a lot of memories at university and after are so much happier. Even those he spent with his sire in their travels across Europe. He seeks to make a place for himself in the court of Cambridge, perhaps writing the coattails of his sire's name. He will, of course... Okay, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, uh, interestingly, your sire, although there are Canites in Cambridge, a handful, uh, your sire seems to have become the advisor to the Prince of Lincoln, and he does return to Cambridge, but he seems to keep court at Lincoln now. I probably would have known there's not many Canites in Cambridge then. Mm -hmm. So he'll move on to Lincoln. You're most welcome in Lincoln. Your sire, uh, Hugh, or Hugo as he prefers to you, has gained great rapport with the prince, Jean Marc de Martinique. And you quickly gain some status by establishing you there. And actually, around the 1370s, you become aware of an organization which Jean-Marc de Martinique is organizing and he's, he's become part of. Uh, it's powerful Canaanite princes that seem to call themselves the Covenant, which is now asserting its authority over England as a kind of oligarchy. And it ostensibly promises some sense of stability for England in the wake of the death of Adam, the once Canaanite lord of England. And this collection of elders, Jean-Marc included, comes to rule the land and even the smaller fiefs such as uh, Cambridge by proxy of lesser princes and oaths. Small vassal fiefs such as Exeter in the south, Anglesey in Wales and Dublin all fall in line. Uh, Cormac is definitely interested to see how this goes. He's never been one of great ambition, but in, an, in a new and rising power, he can definitely seek to make himself useful. It does seem that John Mark is taking Cambridge right under his wing, under his protection, and uh, the Canaanites there are, are quick to swear oaths. And you're there for seeing a lot of it, being so close to one of these great princes. And you see that one of their enforcers, one of their factors, called the Gauntlet, does make an appearance here and there at court. Unfortunately, in the year 1381, the Kine are not experiencing the stability that the Canites seem to have. Under the great burden of high taxation, an already overworked and weakened lower class is battered by more plague and strife, and feebly tries to recover as the Hundred Years' War depletes the country of men. And this tension boils over to the Peasants' Revolt. And you hear that London becomes very dangerous for their class, that reportedly the king had to go into the Tower of London to survive and escape. What does Cormac uh, make of this? Make of the strife occurring among the kind? The peasants' revolt, yep. How much are the Canaanites choosing to get involved in this? Right now, they're not. No more than the extent that it disrupts their own businesses and affairs. 
which is more or less depending on the canine, you ask. It certainly doesn't affect anyone in Lincoln. Yet. He'll try to find out where this Peasants' Revolt seems to be strongest, mostly in London, I assume. Fit. What did you say? He's trying to. He's, he's trying to find out uh, where the the strongest supporters are, are centered. Is it London? Yes, there are similar revolts <clears throat> across the country, but it's mostly in London. That's where it's heaviest. Cormac definitely feels a sense of comradeship with these lower folk who've decided to take what's theirs. So, in the early 13... what is it, 1380s? Mm -hmm. He's going to go to London and see how he can get involved. It doesn't last very long. It's kind of a flare-up of activity, the worst of it being in London, and it's not so much that you can get involved unless you want to involve yourself in violence against nobility, as it seems more driven by emotion of the state of affairs. The high class, upper class, nobility enjoy their privileges of improved sanitation and food as a lower class suffers in living almost in sewage. Do you involve yourself in a violence? That is a fantastic question. It's effectively riots. There doesn't seem to be, you know, organized marches or demands being made. It's anger unleashed. He's not going to get involved in the violence directly, but he will help them as much as he can during this short-lived revolt. Which is to say, he will help them secure weapons and resources. Just to see how far this goes. A, let's see, securing resources. Seneschal will be appropriate, but you're not really trained in that. Mm. Commerce could be helpful here. I'll give you a wits commerce difficulty six. Is that two successes? Yes, and he will, of course, be trying to direct some of the riots away from K-Knights who, who might be involved. He certainly doesn't want to see the silence of the blood broken <gasps> by an angry mob. But mortal royalty, he knows all too well their corruption. You rouse these peasants, these serfs and workers, some of them are just servants. You rouse them and you support them and you're recognized very well for your support. They enjoy uh, supremacy over London. They actually take over London for a few weeks, subduing the guards and forcing the king into the tower with your help and keeping him there. Of course, you know it's only a matter of time until the royal army comes, but it seems like for now you've made a significant change in uh, how long they're going to last, at least. Though you are alerted to 
the ire you're drawing from the London Canites for supporting this, especially the High Clans. Particularly the Ventru, who have lost a great deal of business to this. He will, of course, attend court during these few weeks of this last. Or longer now, perhaps. And try to assuage their fears that in the wake of this rebellion, new opportunities are going to arise. You're viewed as a problem, as a, a jumped-up upstart neonate trying to cause problems where there need not be more. As you know, some canines, you learn some canines are actively trying to stop this, are trying to calm things down and disarm these rebel peasants as you arm them and support them. And you get a few threats in Elysium for your efforts. Although Ambrose forbids any violence against you, you can tell even he is angered by this. Despite the threats, he maintains his cocky demeanor, telling them that they will see, that he's, they will see. Your audacity is inspiring to some of the neonates, but repugnant to many of the elders who think you're out of place, out of line, and the venture of certainly giving you glares. And as was expected, this is put down. The rebellion's put down as the army arrives, but the chaos and terror to the nobility and the aristocracy is felt sharply. As now, not even here can anyone ignore the disparity of classes and the problems of the country. What does he intend to do for the next 20 years, having started this, well, aided this peasants' revolt, impressing a few, angering many. He intends to gather those to him who agree with him that the entrenched aristocracy is a problem. He doesn't want to perhaps incite any more riots or any more violence, but he's going to take to being more insidious in his plans. The Ventru want to hate him? Fine. He'll give them a reason to. You find in London, it's mostly the neonates who agree with you. The Bruja Cash Solis. He seems to take. He seems to take to you. He's not of great standing, but he was known for helping bring down intruders at the Tower of London some time back. And although he doesn't defy the elders, he does think you are right in the imbalance with the nobility. He rabble-rouses even in the court, though. Those who speak against him, he will declaim them as the very aristocracy who he considers a problem. Although he won't do this in a way that says that he's planning any kind of rebellions or anything of the sort. He's being a firebrand for his fellow neonates. Roll your... Hmm. Charisma expression. Difficulty six. You can use presence on this if you want to use presence, but it is Elysium. No. Basically, he's trying to make himself uh, a speaker for the people mm -hmm. without actively opposing any of those. <laughs> he knows the danger in that, who have the power here. You're very successful in uh, 
making waves, certainly. You get into a number of fights, mostly with elders, such as Genevieve Silvers, but also occasionally with the Harpy. Mm, no, not the Harpy. Who am I thinking of? The Ventru one and all hate you for this. The Nosferatu don't really visit Elysium, but Helen, one of the Nosferatu there, one of the harpies that has some status, she seems to get into an argument with you about this. It's mixed, but you're certainly, you've become a known name. People come to either wait to hear your words or, or shut their eyes in tension, waiting to get flared up about it. You become recognizable, certainly. Are there any among the elders who he might try to sway to his side and perhaps uh, gain a bit of protection from? One, another of the Bruja, Alexander Hitchcock, he seems to be of the more religious sort. He reminds you a lot of your sire, actually, uh, although quite, quite a bit more religious, uh, very almost to the extreme version. But he agrees that the aristocracy, the nobility, they have more than they need, that there could be a better balance. And he has the clout to protect you some. Altogether, what he's trying to do is create a sea change here. He does not want to supplant the Ventru, understanding that their legacy is long and old, but the times are changing now. The peasants have revolted, and it won't be long before others get the same idea, regardless of how many died. And that perhaps they might consider a more logical hierarchy. Do you say all of this openly in Elysium? Yes. That the Ventru can rule as equals rather than lords of a domain. A number of debates take place you against mostly the Ventru. One thing about Cormac, though, is that he listens to every side of the argument and he will agree on some points and strongly disagree on others. It seems after a time that they are definitely not willing to budge on this and they view your words of threatening that the, the Canites themselves might start following suit or dangerous words. They're scary. They're frightening to some. Some some accuse you of trying to start such problems. Then one night in a fit of pique he will actually ask them directly since they seem to want to hide their eyes from this. He'll ask, do, do you want me to stop doing this? And why? No one's willing to openly answer that in Elysium. Although you are invited later to speak with Ambrose personally, privately, and he does tell you there are reports of groups of Canites out there who have no concern for the breaking of the signs of the blood, that they are doing exactly what you speak of. They seem to be tearing walls down all around them, and they're worried that that's going to come to London. And for the sake of security and peace, he's telling you to stop. And Ambrose is Seneschal now? Ambrose is the prince. Oh, he's the prince now. That's mm -hmm. right. 
Well, Sorry, if the prince is, that. if the prince is asking it, I know he's probably kept quiet most of the time, but. Cormac will ask him, can I continue if I can prove there's a better way than violence while maintaining the silence of the blood? He tells you to spread your warnings in other cities. To which Cormac replies, so be it. Am I being exiled then? Only if you mean to continue saying what you're saying. As in, you can come back, but don't say, don't continue the rhetoric. So be it, my prince. I will take my rhetoric elsewhere. With a promise to you that I will not try to rabble rouse here again. But I hope in time you will see the wisdom in my words. The wisdom of a young man which you yourself once were. His face is cold to this. He doesn't seem to have any external reaction. And you're allowed to leave. Where do you go in the next 10 to 20 years? Or what do you do? He's going to do just what Ambrose said and spread his rhetoric. Any city in particular? Are you sticking to Covenant main cities or the lesser ones in between? Or the coasts? Or anywhere that'll have you? Anywhere that'll have me, pretty much. He's probably drummed out of quite a few places. But he's not the kind who gives up. Roll. We'll go ahead and give me another... Uh, at this point, I'm going to gift you an expression dot because you've done so much of it in your prelude. Okay. And you can roll that uh, charisma expression again as a general overview of your attempts here over the next 20 years of trying to get people to agree with you that there should be a change, a new, a new order to things. And it's the Covenant that's actually inspiring him in this. They've chosen a new way of ruling. And things can continue to change. So what's the difficulty? Ah, uh, standard. Oh, no one listens. You go to many towns, you're kicked out of a few. It seems like some are willing to listen to you, but by and large, no one wants to hear it. People are content with how things are, at least the canines are. Uh, or at least the ones willing to speak up are content with it. And you don't gain a lot of traction in this elsewhere. By the turn of the century. And by the 15th century, as we turn over, the economy, you can tell, is shifting across England with a depleted workforce. Agriculture is no longer the uh, it's no longer the cornerstone of England and I would say you have enough knowledge of, of finance to tell that you know, things like shipbuilding the trading of ships like the cog is becoming a significant point of investment instead of wool now manufacture and trade of cloth textile is becoming dominant the mining of tin and iron and lead becomes more significant over time, and the fishing fleets have always been profitable. But there is a shift in the concentration of wealth across England, with the, with the exception of York. The eastern ports and the northern lands of England remain agricultural, and they stagnate, they grow poorer, while the southern lands grow more dense with academia, with trade and textile manufacture, it all seems to be concentrating in the southern half. The western port of Bristol becomes very active with imports of cheap goods from Ireland and exporting out to Iceland. Of course, with your wealth invested in Cambridge, your once tried and true investments are now getting a bit shaky. What are your plans for your finances during this time? 
he actually sees that the changes that he's trying to make, at least among the Stagil canines, are not going to work. He's been rebuffed time and again, but perhaps he can make another mark and perhaps shift his finances into mercantile. With the intent of helping to raise up some of those who might have been downtrodden, he won't start by hiring skilled workers. He'll start by hiring those who need help the most and those who are willing to train them. Roll your intelligence, commerce, standard difficulty. It's a marginal success, so you are able to mostly reinvest your silver into more mercantile ventures, which are becoming more popular. Uh, there is, there are these these guilds popping up, these corporations that are starting to better organize merchants together, almost like as a union. And you are somewhat successful in this adaptation, but you find that making use of unskilled labor, trying to both pivot your resources and help the needy is slowing you down significantly. It's it's starting to hurt your income, though not enough to drastically change anything if it continues this way you think it might. Then he'll redouble his efforts. Seeking advice from some of the financial minds around England, if he can find such people to speak to. He will leverage his education against that, though. Well, your sire, in your meetings with him, would have advised going to London, as the Ventru Malachi would have been a wonderful resource to ask for advice or to help get started in finances, but you've thoroughly uh, enraged the Venture there. No one will aid you there, much less talk to you. But that is not the only place you can go for financial advice or counsel. Let's see. Just looking through people here. someone that would come to mind if I could remember who it was. There we go. It's actually in Lincoln. There is a venture there named Colton. You're introduced through your sire He's about your age into unlife, a former wine merchant with a, a flair for schmoozing and manipulation. He's a child of another significant canine of the city named Eden Everly. But he's willing to give you some aid here if you're willing to accept a, a favor owed. He will, with the stipulation that his business model has to work. He's not going to see the downtrodden stay downtrodden. This is all stemming, of course, from his own feeling of rejection in his own life. A feeling useless under the, the foot of the aristocracy. 
and bettering himself. He provides you a few networking contacts that you can make use of that make this a bit easier to transition. He doesn't exactly know why you're trying to go for this new model where it doesn't seem like profit is your main goal, but the contacts he puts you in touch with are very helpful in extending your mercantile interests. And uh, look at my notes again. This segues into something. There is an organization forming called the Worshipful Company of Mercers. It's something of a, a titan of chartered trading companies, of which several have popped up. And he has some contacts among there, and through them you are able to more easily transition your, your investments of silver into some of their endeavors. And a good amount of your resources do seem to be uh, used to employ some of the some of the needy, some of the out of work former farmers who couldn't adapt to the textile work. And at least they seem grateful for the opportunity. Excellent. Well, eventually he's probably going to have to put his eggs in a basket and stop spreading himself so thin. Perhaps uh, funneling his workforce into one trade rather than several. Do you have any trades in mind? Hmm. The most obvious choice would be textile, as that seems to be well on the rise, and it's the cornerstone of this worshipful company of mercers, which does do a number of domains of trade, but it's absorbed the company of drapers, which used to be concentrated on that, and it's very profitable. And textile seems to be the way to go, as it is a very trainable profession. Alright, you have enough financial know-how to maneuver your way into the textile business, but unfortunately it seems that your contacts through the worshipful company of mercers are interested in the size of business. When they realize how many resources you are putting into this, they make you an offer, actually. They offer to buy you out, to take over your contracts, to take over all of the investments you have made and basically turn it into liquid coin. Not realizing that that's more or less where you came from. Yep. Cormac has a business model he thinks is going to work in the long run, so he will rebuff them. At least for now, until they start applying pressure, which might cause him to retort. Indeed, you rebuff them, and after a bit of time, you think that perhaps they're getting their message, and they're waiting for perhaps another message where you change your mind. And after about a month of this waiting, you get a new letter informing, you know, they're apologetic that they could not come to some agreement. 
It's very, it's very short. It's very vague. It's not nearly as wordy or or nice as their initial offer, which was considerable. And over the following months, in the next year and two years, you do find pressure is being applied from somewhere, possibly them. You find your contracts, your contractors, I should say, warehouse managers and merchant fleet captains are not renewing with you for the coming year. That they're signing on with the Worshipful Company of Mercers. They're citing security concerns, the increase in networking, the sheer size of the Worshipful Company offers them a better bottom line. Although you do get the impression a few of them may have been threatened. And he's going, certainly going to find out what is going on here. He will approach each of them individually. Using his gifts as need be. try to convince them that though their bottom line may be better, their their conscience will certainly suffer. Hmm. Mia, charisma, empathy. Difficulty is going to be eight. If you want to use presence here, you can reduce it, but it's, I'm going to say, in this instance, it's only going to decrease difficulty by one. All right, I will then. All right. It's not a botch, but it's not a success. The contractors you speak to, I mean, you do find out a number of them are being intimidated into this work as some of them cite the bottom line as a, a cover-up but in the end whatever their reason you're not able to secure their business and a significant number of your contracts go up in a few years and you have lost a dot of resources to the worshipful company of mercers What's Cormac's reaction to this? This pisses him off quite a bit. So now he's going to try, try to find out who exactly is threatening them. And make it clear that he's not going to accept that as an answer. All right. So I'd say it's around 14.05 that your efforts uncover that it does seem to be agents of the worshipful company that are going out and speaking to these men and they're making offers similar as they made to you to buy out and when some of them decline they start making threats about ruining their business not directly but by other means so with merchant fleets they can control the prices of the docks and the fares they can make it untenable to make it livable as a merchant and they do similar stunts and atrocities to other of your would-be contractors they seem to be manipulating other areas of the markets so that they could ruin any one of these people with their resources unless they oblige and change contract. Behavior like this, of course, brings out the worst in Cormac, who always believes in fair enterprise. <gasps> so perhaps he will have to apply a little bit of pressure of his own.
And how does he mean to do that? He's going to attempt to sabotage some of the efforts of these agents who are threatening his merchant. Okay. By sink, for- sinking ships, or what are you going for? No, he doesn't want to ruin livelihoods in that way, but he's going to make it personal. Which is to say, he's going to try to find out who these people are and apply some pressure of his own. Perhaps threatening themselves or their families should they continue with what they're doing. Okay. You start with what you have to imagine is the bottom level men of these enterprises, these corporations, charter trading companies. Um, They seem like little more than muscly messengers, enough brute on them to give the intimidation factor without any actual violence, perhaps applied violence. Although really they're just, they're just the messengers. Some of them might go back home with broken fingers or broken arms. Some of them who he forces to give him information by force, if need, if need be. Roll Charisma Intimidation. Standard? Uh, difficulty 5. Damn, dice hate me tonight. Even though you didn't get a success, that doesn't really take into account, you know, how strong you are or how ferocious. This is kind of to see, like, how much additional information you get. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the night, you're, you're a canine. You have ways of inflicting pain and getting messages out of these people. So although you're not wildly successful in pulling information from these men, you do get the gist that there seems to be a chain of command that they respond to these these supervisory officers and these officers have links up to masters and then guild masters and perhaps farther up still they aren't educated enough to know the entire process but they just get their orders higher up and they carry them out and then they get paid and they seem to not think any further than that And he'll move on up the chain. All right. You're given the name of one of these lower level officers. And it's in York when you come across this, this individual. And they seem to be doing fairly well for themselves. They have a small house, which is more than many have. And it's within the city walls. It's mostly of wood, but there is some stone foundation. You can tell this this man is probably doing about as well as the average merchant. Uh, maybe a little bit less. Merchants are doing quite well. So you can you get an idea of the affluence of this man, but when you find him, you find that he does have several guards with him, which is actually a bit peculiar for someone of his station. He's not quite important enough to have that, but... This is the first name you're given. He does seem to have some men with him. All right, well, he's gonna turn on the charm when he approaches him at first. Telling him who he is and that he'd like to perhaps arrange a private meeting. You're charming enough, especially with presence, to arrange for a meeting. You're also, you're still, you still have enough resources to come across as more than affluent. So, they, this, this manager, this mid-level officer agrees, and you have a meeting. And uh, the guards are present for this meeting. What do you present to them when you have it? All right, so I 
I'm just trying to think how he wants to word this. He's basically going to try to threaten him. All right. That this has gone on long enough and he needs to tell those who are his superiors that they need to let this go. Or there are going to be consequences they can't even fathom. You threaten this man while he's got his guards around you? Well, yes, he's trying to be fairly diplomatic about it. Okay, like a veiled threat? Yes. Mm. He's not throwing up his fists. Let's say that's... Mm. That could be either subterfuge or intimidation. I'll give you manipulation and intimidation. Difficulty will be seven. Are you using presence for this? Oh, yes. All right, in this case, since it's more... I'm going to say you can add the presence dots to this, since it's more of an in-the-moment kind of thing. As extra dice, you mean? Uh, yeah. Like awe. Do you want me to roll R or just roll the two presence dots? Just the two presence dots in addition. You don't have to roll the actual R. No, it doesn't really help. Okay, still marginal success. He seems taken aback by this. He seems to get the message. And thanks you for bringing this concern to him. But overall... It seems like he's not too sure what to make of you. He's, he can tell there's something different about you, and your words have affected him. But you don't know to what extent or what he will tell his managers above. He's satisfied this for, with this for now, and he's going to see how it plays out. In the meanwhile, he's going to go to all those merchants who have not yet given into the pressure and tell them that their loyalty will be rewarded. The sentiment is approved, or rather appreciated, and the merchants that did not sell out or give in to intimidation, they still seem worried about their livelihoods and about the future, but they appreciate you giving them some confidence. It's also around this time that another rebellion breaks out, you hear, out in the west. It seems that Wales is making this last desperate struggle for independence, led by a man named Owen Glendweir, the nominal Prince of Wales, but the conflict would tear apart the western midlands of England as raids and armies march back and forth, destroying towns and fragile economies. And by 1415, Wales is so devastated, it will take at least a century before it recovers economically. The rebellion is put down, and Owen Glyndebrae disappears in one of the last raids. It's the last hurrah that Wales is expected to make. Inspired by this, Cormac gets an idea. Perhaps because he is such a hero among the, the lower class, at least in a very local region. Maybe he convince, can convince some of those who do work for the mercantiles of the, the, the worshipful <laughs> company that maybe they're not getting everything they deserve. to try and turn some of the Mercer Company's contractors away from them? 
or at least demand more, kind of uh, like an early unionization. You can try. It's going to be tough because this is almost the proto-union that you're dealing with, and it's well controlled. You can tell. And he's just one man. I understand. Mm -hmm. But you can still try. I'll give you a. I'll let you do charisma expression, or you can try something like manipulation finance, depending on how you want to go about it. Hmm. Is he able to leverage any canine help as well? Is Colton willing to lend an ear to his complaints? You still owe a favor to Colton, but he is not turning down extra help for an additional favor, or to turn this one into a major boon. Uh, is Cormac oh. educated enough in prestation to know what that would mean? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is he stubborn enough to take it is the question. He'll, t he'll take another minor boon for now to see how much he can be helped in this. Alright, and to clarify your goal is to have him help you in making these contractors demand more compensation? Well, if I'm going to be adding K-Nets into this, he's actually going to go back to his original goal. He's going to be trying that as well. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I've already said that I'm doing it. But what he's trying to get out of Colton is applying some back pressure to make sure that his own uh, suppliers are not interfered with. Colton realizes who... You're, well, let me clarify first. Do you tell him outright who you're aiming this against, or you do try and obfuscate it? Because you know that he does... He's the one who connected you with the Mercer company to begin with. He'll tell them outright, but then he will also be honest that they're trying to ruin him for no good cause other than their own greed. Uh, once you tell him that, he... He declines. He rescinds the additional boon. He will not help you if it's going to affect business with the Mercer Company because he has investments in them and he's tied up in them as well. Then perhaps he can help Cormac be enfolded into their, under their wing rather than bought out. Do you wish to, you're thinking about becoming incorporated into the uh, Mercer Company? If that's what it takes to make sure that he can continue in the way that he wants to, yes. And he will, of course, show, show Colton the two offers that they sent and wonders if it might somehow be manipulated. Manipulating the offer, how? Rather than buying him out, perhaps they offer him aid to grow his business. explains to you that you are not the first Kainite that he's heard of this problem happening to you. That there was another Aventru not too long ago who was having similar issues up against the Worshipful Company. And he explains to you that it's very rare that they accept anything except total buyout 
that there is really no place for any other... There's no need for the managers of these enterprises to stay on, that they always replace them with their own people. Cormac is frustrated by this, of course, but he has to accept it now. He doesn't demand an extra boon for that information. He offers it freely. He will certainly thank him for his time, but it's very clear that he's put out. It does seem that the worshipful company of Mercer's greed and, and tight control over this business is without quarter. He's already pissed off enough Ventru, so he's not going to try to completely sabotage their operations. Not that that would be possible anyway. As you're dealing with this and battling the Mercer Company, it's around the year 1430 when you hear of trouble in Ireland again. There's reports of increased violence and roaming bands of canines wreaking havoc and threatening the silence of the blood. They sound like the similar problems that Prince Ambrose rumored that were already occurring, but on a scale not heard of before, this seems like enough to overwhelm cities. And indeed, supposedly this band ripped through Dublin, and a number of the Canites there died in the in the chaos. In the chaos. Though the Prince of Dublin, Edward de Warren, survived the attempt on his own life. No one's heard of them in these numbers in mainland England yet, but the apprehension is growing. Cormac is beginning to realize that he's become a, f a small fish in a very big pond. And he does not sit well with hearing of this unrest in his homeland. Given how much he did to protect his own legacy. So. Against his better judgment, he will send the worshipper merchants a notice that he will accept their first offer. But nothing less. You receive a letter from them quite quickly for the rate of mail and letters these days that they will accept your offer at this point at a prorated value of what remains of your business. Effectively what that means is you won't gain any resources, you won't lose any but that your business will basically turn into silver. You'll be all liquid. And they will promise that no more offers will obviously be made on uh, any of your contractors. No more of your wealth must be threatened. Hormick accepts these terms. It takes time for such a large purchase to happen, and yearly installments of silver are made, silver and gold, until the entirety of your contracts is turned into coin and secured, I imagine, at uh, Cambridge, where you originally intended. Yes. Right. Although it is a bitter acceptance, you think perhaps they did have the resources to continue this war much longer than you did, and perhaps you stemmed the blood loss before it got much worse. Uh, 
He'll have to satisfy himself with this for now, as all his efforts seem to be coming to naught. And he thinks back on a time long ago when he sent his own brother to death for his foolish values. He thinks perhaps he should leave well enough alone. All the same, his mind drifts back to Ireland and the troubles that are happening there. And he decides at the turning of the 15th century that perhaps it's time to go back to Dublin to see how he can help. All right. You return to Dublin and you find that even a year after the reports that you heard, they're still recovering from some of the damage. The walls are not fully repaired, there are houses that are burned down, and when you appeal to the court and you visit Prince Edward de Warren, you hear of the, uh, the atrocities. It seemed that this group of, of almost rabid canines seemed to be diablerizing, feeding upon some of the canines in the city devouring them and their souls. It's a most hideous and, and terrifying report. As no one has heard of these kinds of attacks in the British Isles before, not on this scale. Has De Warren um, stayed away from the Covenants up until this time? You learn that Edward de Warren is the child of a prince named Barbaros de Rouen, who is the Prince of Chester, and he is, a, he is one of the seven covenant princes. So this is one of the, chil the children of the covenant princes. Then he will ask the question that perhaps they're not asking themselves. Why don't they appeal to the covenant for aid? He responds to you most grimly that the Covenant does not concern itself with the problems of either Scotland or Ireland. That they are left to fend for themselves. You also learn through talking with DeWarren that the, although he is prince here, it is really an arrangement in favor of his sire. It seems that he makes exports from Ireland into the ports that reach Barbaros at Chester at very low cost. This is little more, apparently, than a, a colony for profit for Prince Barbaros. At least the way de Warren phrases it to you. It seems as though they are content with raping Ireland of its resources, regardless of what happens to it in the meantime. Although Cormac considers what he could do to help this situation, he knows that there's probably very little, given that he's still relatively a neonate, without much influence. closest contact would certainly be your sire, the advisor to Jean-Marc, who is also a member of the Covenant. That is likely your closest connection to an ear of the Covenant. And that's who he'll send a letter to next. To tell him of the situation in Ireland. He replies back to you with a letter weeks later that Jean Marc is well informed of the troubles in Ireland and that although he, Jean Marc, has pity, 
there is nothing that Covenant is going to do as it requires majority to make significant decisions and the majority do not care about Ireland. It seems right now the Covenant is more focused on the Hundred Years' War and how the English economy is faring. For right now the Hundred Year War goes very poorly for England. They are concerned for the borders, they are concerned for invasions of French Canaanites. This is what predominates. This is what predominates the discussions of the Covenant, so you hear it from your sire who hears it from Jean-Marc. Okay. Irritated with this, he asks the prince if he has considered seeking refuge in England with his sire. Given that he does not have the forces to stand against these beasts if they come back. He tells you that his, his sire has effectively stationed him here and to renounce the princedom to escape to England. He cannot tell if he would rather face the huge loss of status and face and the, the anger of his sire or die in this city if these things come back, if these canines come back. And what about another option? That perhaps goes against everything he knows as a prince. What a rebel like Cormac would think of. Shock troops. Do you elaborate on that? Mass embraces. To help bolster their numbers. And perhaps seek out these beasts and destroy them where they lair. He takes that idea very seriously. Roll your manipulation expression difficulty five, let's say. He's open to ideas. And this is one he's not considered. For a reason he has the right of creation, if he wants to make multiple childer, he can do so. Or is that your most recent rule? It was three successes. Okay, perfect. You are very convincing to the Prince of Dublin, and it, he seems to be very favorable to the idea. Initially, he's put off, but your arguments are convincing. He's not sure where they lair, but he does have ideas for how to quickly mass embrace with what they do have and turn it into something of a, a quick fighting force at least. He explains to you that he means to look for their lairs now and perhaps when he has found them then he will unleash such things. And he is glad for your idea for your support and your innovation. Bolstered a bit by this success, although it's still in its early stages, Cormac office offers to stay on, if he'll have it, and help him carry it through, perhaps impressing the Covenant in the meantime with their ingenuity. Yes, absolutely. You gain a contact in him, certainly, and he does invite you to stay and stay on as his seneschal, as the last one was eaten. Cormac accepts. The two of you work closely, creating plans for this mass embrace. You work together, creating a good recruitment pool, men who are already brawlers, capable of, of bloodshed, especially those who perhaps have done grave sins and it would not be a great shame for their loss. The criminals that perhaps could be used and put to better purposes. 
you think you have 20 or so of these candidates ready. And now really all you need to do is find one of these roaming bands. Does the prince have any gangrel in his service who might be able to help with this? He does. You learn that actually a good number of the Canites in Dublin are gangrel, known as the, the Pale. This area seems to be segregated from the rest of Ireland between Dublin and Cork. As most as more Norman than Irish. But many of them are gangrel. Then he asked the prince if he might appeal to their desire for blood. He gives you leave to do so. And over the next few weeks, Gangrel or uh, <laughs> Hormick's actually going to approach the Gangrel Absolutely. and tell them tell them what his plans are. Which is to which is to say, find these beasts in their lairs, set up tactics, and take them down. And given all of your roles in this prelude, I'm going to give you a gift of leadership dot and on that I'll have you roll a uh, charisma leadership to gain these gangrel to your side and help them to have them help you in this fight alright difficulty I'll go standard nice three successes yes a complete success you managed to recruit some of the gangrel especially in cork uh they're definitely willing to join you, uh, willing to, although their city has not been hit, they knew of the ruin that happened in, in Dublin, and they don't want to see that happen to Cork. They join up with you, and you feel emboldened by having a number of gangrel in your ranks now. What was the prince's last name? I just need to write down for my notes. The prince's last name was DeWarren. Edward DeWarren. He will report to DeWarren that he was successful and the Gangrel will help them find these bestial canites. Through your combined efforts and the resources you're gathering, you and DeWarren discover that the band that came through Dublin, made landfall in England, in Cornwall. Wait, who made uh, landfall in Cornwall? I'm sorry. The initial group that attacked and basically sacked Dublin and killed all these canites, they left Ireland and made landfall in Cornwall, on England, mainland England. So this is where he appeals to De Warren's better nature. Do they help the England who would not help them? Or do they attend to Ireland's needs alone? De Warren suggests that they, you take the offensive with him, that they send off these, that two of you send off these gangrel and these shock troops and hunt them down. That perhaps by showing their worth and showing the danger they pose, they can both earn the respect that is needed for Ireland and eliminate a threat. And Cormac does one better and offers to go with them. All right. De Warren stays in the city to rule and apologizes that he will not attend personally, trusting that you will see to this.
Cormac is sure that he can succeed. You're given command over the ten gangrel from Cork and the twenty now ghouls of De Warren who have been instructed to follow you into battle. And you sail out across the waters and soon enough you make landfall in, Corn in Cornwall yourself. And after a number of, and this takes, you know, a few months of organizing, going back and forth, and then making the trip. But eventually you do make it, and after a few weeks of tracking, some of the gang will report to you, they found an outcropping. It looks like a, a town that's been butchered and now inhabited only by canines. Ten in number. Not the size that you had heard of attacking Dublin, but still significant. And probably dangerous. Well, definitely dangerous. He will use what knowledge of tactics he had from his training as a youth and his studies of history while at university to formulate a plan for a, a pincer maneuver that will prevent any from escaping should they decide they want to try. Relying on the element of surprise to help the plan succeed. Absolutely. Make an intelligence academics role to formulate a plan and that's going to aid you later. Alright, difficulty? Standard. Whoa. Four successes. That's your plan impresses everyone involved. Uh, they all look to you with, with renewed confidence and respect. At, uh, it, it's a very clear plan. It looks very solid. Everyone here seems to agree it's the best, the best option here. This pincer maneuver. And with over, archers on the hill to catch any who are trying to flee. And over the next few nights, you and these men carefully organize yourself around this camp being careful not to be hidden or not to be seen rather and you launch an attack at the same time these 20 ghouls are embraced knowing that they were going to undergo some kind of change for battle but mostly explained it without anything breaking the sounds of the blood and so they are made into weapons that are difficult to control, but easy to unleash. Roll your charisma leadership, and you can use your successes on your last roll as additional dice. On the uh, intelligence roll that I did? Mm-hmm. So charisma, leadership, and your past successes, difficulty six. Nice. It's, it's a smashing success, almost quite literally. Your shock troops ride into the village as the Canites are grouped together for some kind of meeting or some kind of discussion. And at the same time, you come in with these gangrel from the east and the north as arrows come down. And it's, it's almost a bloodbath. There's almost... It's certain that these are dangerous canines, but you overwhelm them quickly. And soon, taking a few losses, you have secured this location. You've killed them all, one and all. Uh, piles of ash and blood and gore on the streets. It's a certainly terrible image for Sounds of the Blood, but no one still lives here. Several of the Gangrel have died, and a number of these, a good number of these shock troops have died. But it is a one. The night is one. Reveling in victory, Cormac will gather those who remain to him to praise their unity. And he will give them a rousing speech about 
how the Irish will never be overcome, not by any man or beast. Your words ring true, and many look to you with with glimmers of of inspiration in their eyes. Most of the gangrel have survived, and and they look to you, seeing a a truly ferocious leader in you. The shock troops are a bit distracted as they grapple with what they've become, but even they seem to be impressed. Still, he tells them, the battle's not over yet. They have to make sure that there were no others that fled further to the east. And if they find that none have moved on, then they can return to Dublin and plan the next moves. You don't find any tracks here that suggest anyone else was in the area. But you are reminded that the group that hit Dublin was Sigmore, was larger. Perhaps this was part of it, but... There must be some further out there, but at this point, who knows where they are in England. Then he resolves himself to send notice to the nearest city to expect their arrival. But he can't do that now. He did not bring the resources to do so. And urges his cadre of vampires to return to Dublin. And return they do grateful to have been led by someone like you. They go on to report back to DeWarren, you imagine. Where will Cormac go now? What is the nearest city to the coast? See, I want to say it's Exeter, but let's... No, you, you're still in Cornwall, Exeter's farther east, so that would probably be Plymouth. It's a port city to the south of you, not far in the, not far, not too far. That's where he'll head next with the hopes that they have swift messengers to carry messages further east. Of course, they do have ships. Those travel quite well for delivering messages. And uh, a message is delivered out of Plymouth, and it heads east, aiming for London, but stopping in Canterbury along the way. He will, of course, make it quite clear in his missive how dangerous and bestial are, and how it was the Irish who routed them. Ignored, but impossible to forget. Your message is carried. And with messages delivered and men heading back to Ireland, it draws in on the middle of this period of this 15th century. And you have heard about how poorly the Hundred Years' War has been going as battles and provinces are lost to the French who have developed a professional standing army and robust use of the cannon, which is now appearing on refitted cogs alongside archers and crossbowmen. You've also heard that the greatest English general, John Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury, was finally killed near Bordeaux at the Battle of Castillon in 1453. Unfortunately, with his death, the control of Aquitaine by the English is lost, and it seems that the Hundred Years' War comes to a dark close with a French victory. Veterans of the war returning to a battered and bitter England, where now a highly corrupt circle of dukes and earls is said to surround the weak and ineffectual King Henry VI, led by his wife, Queen Margaret of Anjou. Word spreads of your success, and your sire congratulates you on what you've done for England and for its safety and stability. 
Some fame has been gained of the Irish and of their fighting prowess, especially after these reports. Supposedly even the Covenant is taking notice and they've begun sending out scouts to see if they can locate this this remaining band. By 1454, the Covenant has held control for nearly a century with the Gauntlet enforcing its will until you hear of its complete utter destruction in March. The Gauntlet, one and all, is gone, abruptly. Having died in some kind of fire or assault, apparently at the estate of Gaetan de Corvo, the venture member of the Gauntlet. And for several weeks, there is a flurry of activity and messengers of riding here and there, hastily delivering reports, trying to make sense of what has happened and what will happen next. How is Cormac reacting to all this? Or does he care at all of the gauntlet? He has, of course, returned to Dublin by this point, realizing that Ireland has and always will be his home, and he has a place of Seneschal now. But he can't help but be worried about this news, about this gauntlet. He found the Covenant to be a, a breath of fresh air as far as the leadership of Keenites go, and he'd hate to see their arms so hastily destroyed. He will send message to Hugh to, to ask if there's anything that he can do. You don't get a message back from Hugh after you send it, but within a few weeks, Hugh himself appears to you abruptly one evening while you're in Dublin with a calm and serious face. It is the expression of a one-tracked mind similar to how he looked in that of your embrace. You have heard the news, I assume. You're speaking of the gauntlet. Indeed, I am. It is a tragedy. Peace is a fragile thing, Cormac. I did not hope to see it so readily adopted after Adam's demise. But it is only through vigilance that peace can be upheld. I agree entirely. This is a shocking blow to all of us. Jean-Marc confides his distress to me, and I confide in you that the Covenant is in dire need of new agents. He looks to you pointedly. Speak plainly. There is passion in you, Cormac. There's a strong mind guiding it as well. Your success is well known now. Your wit, your leadership would serve them well. I think you should take up the mantle of the gauntlet. Would they have me after all I've done in England? How many pantaloons I've pissed in? You are a contentious choice, to be certain, because of your words. But it can be waved away as the fiery rhetoric of the neonate. You have enough years now that your wisdom will be known as it has shown in your leadership. Is this an official request from the Covenant, then? It is an unofficial request by me for you to take the nomination. They must vote on it. Cormac thinks about the events of his life from early on till now. Successes and failures.
Very well, old friend, I accept. I am gladdened by this, especially because I had already put forth your name and nomination. And he smiles warmly. You cheeky bastard. He shakes his head, but he's smiling. I think you will do much good there. When will I hear of the official nominations? A few weeks at most. Should I be chosen, I'll have to find another seneschal. Your prince is the child of one of the Covenant. They will find what they need. You need not worry. I worry for any chance of good Irish blood being spilled. As it already has been. His face is dour, but he nods. With the influence may... you may wield, you may be able to do more for your homeland than before. Why do you think I accepted? And he'll laugh then, heartily. He smiles. He's a smile of an old man. A tired old man, but a smile nonetheless. I shall see you in a fortnight when I expect we have news. I look forward to it. And he turns to depart. And true to his word, it is less than a fortnight later that you are informed your presence has been requested in Wiltshire County of all places. And your sire offers to join you on the ride. And it is henceforth that he shall go. Wishing the Prince of Dublin the greatest luck and hoping he continues what they've started. The Prince of Dublin is a bit put off that he's losing his seneschal, especially one with such prominence and influence now, but he understands that his, his sire and the Covenant will have what they want, and that he hopes that your elevation will come back to aid Ireland one night. Cormac swears to that. And with that, he, he bids you his blessing. And... At that point, we are going to end the prelude as the next session will be in the group.